Okay, perfect. It didn't say recording started though. It, it's on. Okay, sounds wonderful. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is designed to be an uh, update about ArborJet, uh, everything from equipment to what we're seeing with pests uh, to different uh, changes on labels with the chemicals. So it's kind of an overall view. So I know this was geared a little bit more towards California because we're getting California Department of Pesticide Regulations uh, CEU credits. Um, however, it, it does pertain to the rest of the country as well. So don't feel like you're being excluded. Uh, you know, we just Californians can't help but to focus on ourselves. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with the equipment. And part of the reason why I, I always start at this very first step with the equipment is because that doesn't matter what piece of equipment you're using, the process does not change. The first thing you always gotta do is identify the tree you're working on and the pest or disease you're treating for. That is always your, your step one. Um, I know sometimes there's issues with identification. That's the most challenging part we probably usually run into. And keep in mind, we're always here to be a resource. So if you are having a problem identifying, or identifying a pest or a disease, feel free to send us photos. You can send me a photo of the entire landscape and then, you know, kind of the tree in it, and then a close up of what it is uh, you want me to identify. So I can kind of get the whole idea of what's going on with the tree and the landscape. And then we can help you with the identification process. From there, you're always going to measure the tree. Do not skip this step. I tell you, it's one of the most important ones because uh, it tells you two pieces of information one, how many injection sites you're going to be putting into this tree, and two, how much chemical you're going to be using in the tree. So we always follow the label. So make sure when you're measuring, you read the correct dosing label, uh, dosing amount on the label. Then we're going to drill into the tree. We're going to stay in the bottom 18 inches of the tree. Uh, please do not go higher than 18 inches. And actually, if you can go lower, it's better in a lot of cases. If you can get into buttress roots or root flares, those are ideal. It's usually thinner bark, faster uptake, and wider distribution. So go lower if you can. Um, and then we're going to just tap in one of our one-way uh, ports. We call them arbor plugs. That way we make sure the chemical stays trapped inside the tree. And then you're going to use various pieces of equipment to inject through that plug and get the chemical trapped inside that tree. So I always go over this because this is one of the key things we talk about uh, in doing the injection process with the equipment. So the equipment we tend to be seeing used most at this point in time is actually the quick jet and the tree IV. Uh, if any of you guys already have some injection equipment out there, uh, you'll realize that um, the quick jet is a handheld device where your hand is pushing the chemical into the tree, whereas the tree IV system is actually an air pressure system where you put the chemical in the bottle and then you pump up the bottle and then that air pressure actually pushes the chemical into the tree. Uh, a little less wear and tear on the applicator. Um, but it kind of depends on user preference and type of tree you're working with usually as to which uh, piece of equipment you're going to be using. So with that being said, because of the whole COVID-19, um, we're seeing more use of these two pieces of equipment at this point in time, mainly for the fact that anyone who has been using uh, our air system is finding air difficult to, to, to track down at this point, because a lot of those are not essential businesses and they're closed. So if you are running into an issue where you're having difficulty finding air for your air tank, you're going to be going back to the quick jet because your hand pressure is always there. <laughs> um, keep in mind, it's designed to work exactly the same in the fact that the chemical is gonna be coming out of the chemical bottle. Either you're gonna screw that cap right onto the bottle or you're gonna fill this bottle with the chemical. Make sure whenever you do fill a bottle with chemical, you put that label on there to identify correctly what is in that bottle and who's responsible for it. And then all the dosing is actually going to be do done right there on the dose sizer. So you read your label, whatever it says, how many mils you need to put in. You're going to adjust that dose sizer. And when you actually squeeze that handle, it's going to push that chemical directly inside the tree. So when you release that handle, it's going to refill that chamber and it's going to be ready to go again. So there are check valves at the front of the unit to make sure that the chemical goes into the tree and doesn't push back into the unit. And there's a check valve at the bottom to make sure that chamber is always refilling and always ready to go. And then we go ahead, go down to that base of the tree, and we do our injection. And I have been using this slide for years because it is my best way to introduce what not to do with PPE. Um, PPE for trunk injection is pretty basic. It's your standard long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, shoes, correct diameter, uh, or chem correct mill, uh, chemical gloves, and certified eye protection. And as you can see in this photo, uh, we have lost a glove along the way. 
unfortunately, I've seen this all too often. It's, it's a very common mistake we tend to see with trunk injection. You might be writing something down or doing something with the equipment, and all of a sudden you take a glove off. Uh, next thing you know, you don't have it back on, and you're now in violation of the label requirement of the PPE on the chemical. So be aware of that. Always read all your labels and all their PPE requirements. Uh, some do vary, but most of them standard the follow protocol. Uh, the other thing you'll notice on the photo is those don't look like certified eye protection, do they? They kind of look like those cheater reading glasses. Well, there's no cheating in PPE, so make sure you have the correct certified eye protection. Because uh, if you notice, your face is right down there where the application is being done. And we want to make sure everyone is well protected uh, from any accidental uh, exposure. So this was the kit that I was talking about where we're having a little issue getting air at this point in time because most people fill that 3000 PSI air tank with compressed air from paintball shops or dive shops, which are currently not open. Um, they are able to go to some welding shops that are an essential business, fire stations, some of them have the ability to fill this. Um, however, we don't really want to be bogging down our first responders by uh, trying to get air. Uh, there is uh, a couple different compressors on the market that you can get that will actually fill those 3000 PSI compressed air tanks. Um, we've seen them range from anywhere from 400 to $1,200, uh, but it is a way to fill tanks. And we're also looking at other methodologies, getting out to distributors who might also be able to fill tanks as well soon. So right now, uh, definitely plan ahead uh, for what you're going to be doing. And if you're going to be using the system, just realize that uh, air right now could be a limiting factor for you. Okay, so with uh, any injection that we do, all the chemical we're trying to put into the tree, we're trying to put in that xylem tissue, the, the water flowing tissue of the tree. We actually want to go past the bark. We want to go past that cambium layer. And we want to set the blood below the cambium layer in the xylem tissue, the water flowing tissue of the tree. Because what we're doing when we inject that chemical down at the base of the tree, we're putting the chemical in the water flowing tissue of the tree and the tree is doing the work for us. It's actually diluting that chemical and circulating it throughout the entire tree. So it doesn't matter if you have a 90 foot tall eucalyptus tree, the tree at the top, the last leaf at the top getting water will also get the chemical. So wherever the water's flowing, the chemical is going to be carried. So that's why it's really important to make sure we get that chemical in that xylem tissue uh, of the tree so the tree can quickly move it and dis distribute it for us. And we do it by using what we call our arbor plugs. And the reason why we choose to use this arbor plug is because the plugs themselves, sorry about that, have a white rubber septum that the needle actually goes through, ruptures, and injects out the back. This stops that needle from touching the tree at any point in time so we don't have any opportunity to vector disease on the actual injection needle. Uh, the drill we use to drill in could, so do be sure to sterilize your drill bits between infected trees or disease-ridden uh, trees. Um, and in this case, when we actually set this plug, we want to make sure we set it below that cambium layer so that way the tree can quickly lay down bark and new xylem tissue over the top. Uh, we have many reasons why we advocate for this plug, but really honestly the number one reason is because it keeps the chemical trapped inside the tree. It makes sure we know we got that full dose in the tree, nothing's leaking out, there's no exposure to the public with concentrated chemical coming out of the tree, and we know we got the full dose in the tree that the label said will take care of that pest or disease we're trying to treat for. That's the main reason. I mean, it's also excellent for keeping out any sort of secondary disease or pest at the site. Um, so kind of keep that in mind when, when using or choosing to use this plug. Uh, we always advocate for it in the urban environment. Um, outside the urban environment, uh, you may choose to use a different methodology. And then of course, in order for any injection to work, we have to water. Um, it's best to give the tree a little bit water prior if it hasn't had water. That way it kind of wakes up those root hairs, those water absorbing uh, material and starts that vascular tissue flowing. It makes the injection process that much easier. But then afterwards, you wanna make sure you kind of water that tree in. So there's plenty of water to move that chemical up through the xylem tissue. It's especially crucial in timing where we're used to having a lot of spring rain um, and all of a sudden say we're out there doing fire blight treatments and we need that chemical to move quickly. We have to make sure the tree has the water in order to be able to do that. So that, that is one of the keys when working with uh, tree injection, but any systemic application truly you have to make sure the tree has water and can move it. And I'm sure you guys have all probably seen that article out now about the West being in a new type of mega drought. 
Well, truly, we've all been kind of talking about that over the years anyway. We always knew we had a really bad drought and that it takes at least a year of good rain for every year you're in drought. And we clearly did not get out of that uh, before this new kind of a uh, drought is setting in. So therefore, a lot of our trees are gonna be drought stressed. Just because they get supplemental water from turf, it's really not enough to support the trees uh, during times of drought. So just be aware of that and make sure you're treating appropriately uh, and making sure you give the trees plenty of water during this time and anytime you're doing an application. So I'll kind of review some of the reasons why we're injecting the trees. You guys know this one probably better than I do at this point because you've heard me say it probably a thousand times. But the main reason why we do trunk injection on trees is because the chemical stays trapped inside the tree. It's not in the air, it's not in the soil, it's not in the water. We can do applications next to pools, next to lakes, riparian environments, um, because that chemical is staying trapped inside the tree. But the one thing people don't always think of is the fact that the chemicals trapped inside the tree, it actually makes for longer residuals on a lot of our chemicals. They last longer inside the tree because they're not breaking down due to sunlight or microbes uh, breaking them down in the soil. So that's a benefit not everyone always thinks about, um, but it definitely is. So keep that in mind whenever you're working with trunk injection. And of course, we see a lot of people tend to use it in environments where um, they can't close an area for applications, such as hospitals or college campuses. That's a difficult one to close down. Um, and so if people are always going to be around in the public, it's really hard to shut it down. So trunk injection can be done while the public's around. So kind of keep that in mind for, for application timing. And then the last one that, this is a hard one, and I, I hate to say, you have to almost explain it every time to customers, is the fact that when we inject chemical inside the tree, only the pest feeding on the tree actually gets the chemical. So the beneficial pests in the environment aren't actually feeding on the tree, they're not getting the chemical. But if, for instance, say you treat a tree and you eliminate all the aphids on the tree and all the lady beetles were feeding on those aphids, well, the aphids are gone and dead, so, now you've reduced their food source, so obviously they're gonna move on to another location where there's food. So we still see a reduction in beneficial populations just because their food source is gone, but not because they've been feeding on the tree and getting the chemical. So kind of keep that in mind uh, when working on an integrated pest management program uh, with natural predators. And then last but not least, it has the least environmental impact uh, because of the reduced amount of chemical we actually introduce into the environment. So those are just some of the reasons why we're doing our tree injection. I wanna give you some of the updates on some of our labels uh, that we're currently using. The one I've had the most questions on are the triage labels. Uh, if you guys have worked with ArborJet at all, uh, you're probably familiar with our family of triage products, which is the active ingredient is emamectin benzoate. Uh, there was the original triage, which was federally restricted. Um, and then a couple years ago, we got uh, the triage G4, which was a general use uh, triage. And the newest one that just hit the market is the triage R10. And triage R10, again, denoted by the box in the upper left-hand corner, it's a federally restricted uh, pesticide. So that means you have to show your applicator's license to purchase it. And the person with the applicator's license has to be on site during application. Whereas say you're using the general use triage, that person just has to be a phone call away. Uh, they don't actually have to be on site. So the, the real reason why I always kind of point out these label changes, because there are three different triages, I don't want people to be confused. So the R10 is the newest one on the market. It's R10 because it's got twice the concentration of the other two older triage products. It is also a warning label, uh, but the benefits of using uh, this product is, one, we have to put a lot less into the tree because the increased concentration, but also it's actually labeled uh, for the invasive shot hole bore, so that's nice. And then the even bigger benefit to it is the fact that it labels, calls out that it can be mixed with propozole. So this is the only triage product that can legally be mixed uh, with another chemical called propozole, which is a propoconazole. So we use that combination a lot of times in tandem with uh, some sort of beetle uh, and disease uh, combination. So that is the R10. That's kind of the updates I wanted to give you on that label. If you have any questions, feel free, uh, don't hesitate to ask. This was the G4 label, the prior one that came out. Do notice that G4 is a general use. It doesn't have that box at the top, saying it's federally restricted. It's also a caution label, but it, it still has that ability to treat for the invasive shot hole bore on it. 
Uh, so the triage label is one of the most broad labels for boring beetles. Um, and so there's a lot more expanded listings uh, on these labels for uh, boring pests. The other thing I want to point out on the labels though is here on this sheet here, you can see we have triage the original. And again, you see that restricted use box at the top saying it's federally restricted. So you have to show your license to purchase and have that applicator license on site. Um, but also triage comes with the two double label. So the original triage of the 2W that lists things like the shuffle bore um, and some other pests on there. So if you are treating for that pest with the original triage, you have to have the 2 E label on site with you at the time of application. So uh, make sure you print that off and have it in there. Propozole is the other one that in California has a 2 E label for a lot of the pests or diseases we use it for, such as Fusarium and Geosmithia. So be sure, again, if you're using Propozole in California, that you have that extra 2 E label printed out and you have that with you at the time of your application. So just some of that uh, work we got to cover to keep ourselves all up to date and doing the correct things on labels. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out to you was that uh, for the tree growth regulators, we're seeing some changes in the industry. Uh, I just wanted to give you an update uh, that the shortstop 2SC label has received federal uh, registration for the shrub amendment. Um, so we're now waiting on individual states to register that. So as you guys know in California, we might take a little extra time to get that, uh, but do know that it's in the works um, and that there'll be an announcement coming out and more training on it uh, once it is actually registered in the state of California. So let's get into the pests. I want to cover some of the main pests and do a quick pest update for you uh, as to what's going on. And I gotta say, the winner so far this year of 2020 um, is gotta be powdery mildew. I, I kid you not, it has probably got something to do with the fact that we had pretty early wet season and then all of a sudden it got warm and dry in February. We didn't get a drop of rain in February. Well, it got warm enough that the uh, powdery mildew became active. And unfortunately, then we started getting rain again in March and wow, did it really kind of rear its ugly head. So, we, so far we've seen it on oaks and sycamores and various shrubs, of course, crepe myrtles, because it's always on crepe myrtles. Um, but um, just realize that if, if you're all of a sudden noticing crispy leaves, rolled up leaves, um, odds are it, it probably was a powdery mildew infection. Um, if it's a minor infection, you can get away with using some of the botanicals, uh, 25B product sprays, uh, you can kind of knock it back. But uh, if it's a, it's a really bad infestation, you're gonna have to go with um, some sort of propconazole spray, uh, whether it's propozole or Banner Max or what have you, uh, to, to really get good control over it. Uh, we do not really use trunk injection uh, to control uh, powdery mildew because it's a topical infection. So it really does not work well in the system that way to suppress the disease. However, uh, we're now doing new research that's actually showing that uh, Remember those tree growth regulators I was talking about? Yeah, so it uh, turns out by reducing that internode length and kind of making the leaves a little bit smaller with a thicker cuticle layer, it's harder for the fungal infection to adhere. Uh, so we're noticing reduced instances of powdery mildew on trees that have been treated with tree growth regulators. So if you have any questions with that or want to do some research with it, let me know. Uh, more than happy to, to work with you guys on that one. But those are a couple of ways we can mitigate the powdery mildew issue. Uh, the other one is, is if you have uh, irrigation that really creates a fine mist spray, try and switch it out with something slightly water, a larger water droplets, so that way we don't get a lot of that moisture movement up into the canopy of the trees and help spread the disease that way. So just one of those little tips and tricks. And if you haven't already been out there doing your fire blight treatments, you might be a tiny bit late, um, partly because of that warm February we had. We've seen everything kind of pop almost two weeks early now at this point. Um, so a lot of our pear trees have already flowered and started to leaf. So anything that's already popped out is would or could possibly be exposed uh, to the infection, the bacterial infection of fire blight. So you may see some uh, breakthrough uh, if you've not yet done your applications. So the thing that I always kind of point out with fire blight is it is a cool season uh, disease. It does not show up when we get into our hot temperatures. This only really shows up in the first few months of the year when we're kind of cool and wet. Once it warms up, this disease becomes inactive. 
the only time we really have to worry about uh, suppressing it and stopping it from spreading is in early spring. So a lot of times we'll say, make sure you do your applications. Um, usually second week of January, you can probably get started. Usually we do them through February. Um, and with that being said, get the early time and you have good moisture moving through the tree, you can get it dispersed quickly. You can really suppress that fire blight from breaking through. You don't get that death and die back uh, on the branches. Now keep in mind, this is an annual application because the chemicals we're using, the oxytetracycline, it only suppresses the disease, it does not cure it. So this is something where you're gonna be coming back year after year doing your applications. So make sure that it's worthwhile with that tree, it's a high enough value tree. Uh, that you want to do that sort of investment with. Otherwise, it may behoove you to work it into a five-year plan of a removal and replacement of another tree type that is not susceptible. And notice how I didn't say another pear type that's not susceptible. And that's only because we've seen time and time again varieties that are supposedly resistant to fire blight um, have this tendency of becoming less and less resistant under higher uh, disease pressure. So if you have a line of trees that are infested and you replace one with that's resistant, it will eventually succumb to the fire blight infection. So just kind of keep that in mind when, when dealing with fire blight. So cool season disease only really pops out in the cool season. If you start seeing death and dieback in the warmer season, that means you're probably looking at Botrysphaeria canker or bot canker as opposed to fire blight. It's kind of hard to tell the difference because if you look at the way it dies, you get that dead branch, the leaves hang on, you kind of get that crook to it. Um, Botrysphaeria canker can look very similar to it in our, in our hardwoods. So keep that in mind, the way you can really tell if it's fire blight or Botrysphaeria canker, it's by the time of year when it starts to show up. So Botrysphaeria being a fungal infection, it likes to show up when the temperatures are warmer. And so we tend to see this one starting to show up in like May, June, July, at which time, fire blight's pretty much dormant. So we don't see a lot of crossover. And if you wanna get up close and look at the branch, you can almost always see that kind of canker or a lesion that's actually occurring on the branch and where it's dying out from. So get up close, you can kind of see the difference. Problem with this one is it's a fungal infection. So a lot of times uh, you have to treat it with a phosphorus treatment. Uh, you can do bark sprays, trunk injection but you need to get it before this disease is really active. So again, you're probably doing it in early spring or even possibly fall, giving it plenty of time to get into the tree, circulate through the tree and let the tree start protecting itself before this disease is, is really active. So keep that in mind when dealing with these. I always put these two next to each other because they're quite commonly confused with one another. Anthracnose, anthracnose is not usually terribly confused with other diseases. The only time I tend to see anthracnose getting confused with another disease is when I'm working with oak trees. And we will sometimes see diplodia show up on our oaks that can sometimes look like anthracnose. So when we deal with anthracnose and sycamore trees as their own group, um, we always talk about using phosphorus. And the reason why we do that is because phosphorus will uh, suppress the anthracnose, but it'll also suppress the Botrysphaeria canker. So, Botrysphaeria canker is kind of known to getting into our sycamores, so with that being said, a lot of times we will try and treat phosphorus on our sycamore anthracnose. However, if you're dealing with anthracnose on oaks, ash, elm, you want to use more of a propiconazole uh, type based product uh, to suppress that particular uh, fungal infection. Um, can you use propiconazole on ash trees? Yes. Yes, you are. I'm sorry, on sycamore trees? Yes, you can. Um, it's just you can get a couple diseases with the phosphorus, so we tend to go with that recommendation. You definitely want to get it in the fall, though, so there's plenty of time for it to circulate throughout the tree before they leaf out come spring. And then um, whenever you're dealing with anthracnose and the oaks or ash or elm, we'll say do the prop propiconazole in the fall as well. So you can do spray methodologies with these. Uh, we've found much better uh, coverage and protection with trunk injection going after this particular disease. And then sudden oak death. I am talking about this one a lot. And it's because we're gonna get that warm light rain again, which we've seen over the last couple years. And we know it's that warm light rain that really helps spread this one. So now we've seen it actually moving quite a bit in the last two years. Uh, we already know it's, it's an uphill battle. Um, where we get it infected, it, it's just going to spread. Uh, but the whole idea is identify where it is and then make a, an action plan on how to treat it. 
So right now I just saw a horrible infestation that's just moved out into the Orinda area of the Bay Area. And unfortunately, it's big mature trees being attacked. So that being said, a lot of times uh, we'll recommend doing a bark spray of phosphorus on younger trees. Trees are usually at least 12 inches in diameter or smaller. Their bark's a little bit thinner. They maybe don't have as much debris on their bark because they're younger. It's much easier to get that, that phosphorus spray to uh, penetrate the bark uh, than you do on the older, more mature trees. So, and we tend to say the phosphorus bark spray is an every year application. Whereas if you do trunk injection, you can do it every two years. And that's what we really recommend against the larger, older, mature trees. Because that way we know we're getting the full dose in, we're protecting that tree, uh, and we don't have to come back but every two years to really treat for it. So that is something we're seeing. So pay attention out there for the sudden oak death. It is on its move. It is going to be another bad year. Uh, so just kind of make a good action plan. And the question that I keep getting is, how much should I do it preventatively? And honestly, it really depends if the disease is right next door to you or if you've got a couple miles to spread it apart. If you have good distance, um, I say just do slight preventative every couple years if you can. Um, if it's next door, you want to be much more aggressive in your treatment pro uh, uh, program. Uh, this disease is, is very, very virulent and moves very quickly. So kind of keep that in mind when dealing with it. Okay, into the pests. So the only pest I always talk about, and I talk about aphids because, wow, that is still the number one pest we treat for. Um, and it's not because it kills trees. It's, it's solely because it's a nuisance pest. It creates that honeydew and it makes a sticky, icky mess and the black sooty mold discolors things and looks unsightly. And so this is still the number one pest we actually get called for. So that being said, I always address aphids and the one thing I want to say is keep in mind the life cycle on aphids, how quick it is, and use that to your advantage when you're doing your treatments. Yes, you can do soil drenches of imidacloprids, you can do bark sprays of neonics, um, you can do trunk injection of, of various products. Um, but I really try and say is if this is a particular infested tree that you know always gets aphids, Try and be more preventative of it. Try and get in in fall. Do your application. Uh, you can use midacloprid. You can use acephate. There's lots of different ones you can work with. Um, but get in in the fall. Protect that tree for when the pests are going to move in in spring, as opposed to waiting till spring and letting that population build and then trying to have to fight it back. Um, because at that point, you're fighting it back, but it's also spreading throughout the landscape. Um, so try and stay ahead of it if you can. But uh, a lot of times, if you're dealing with some sort of um, aphid infestation that is throughout the entire landscape, really to get good control, you, you kind of have to start with a whole landscape management plan. So keep that in mind. You might be able to get it out of the tree, but it, it's still going to be in like Mrs. Smith's roses and everything else uh, throughout the landscape, and it will just reinfest the tree. So you want to make sure you create a plan where your timing is accurate and will protect that tree all year. And if you apply for aphids and you notice that the honeydew keeps falling, you might want to look a little closer and see if maybe you accidentally have scale on your tree. And the reason why I say this is because imidacloprid is one of the common uh, insecticides we use against aphids. But unfortunately, imidacloprid does not work well against hard scale. So if all of a sudden you've treated this tree and you still have honeydew falling, you might want to look closer. Look at the stems, look at the leaf petioles, and see if you can possibly find hard scale. Usually imidacloprid will take care of soft scale, so that won't be an issue. That's not usually what you'll find, uh, but you'll usually find hard scale. And you have to actually go into using more things like dinotefurons and acephates to really knock back the hard scales. So sometimes you have to do a combination application uh, of two different chemicals to really take care of hard scale. Whereas soft scale, like I said, just a little midacloprid and you can usually take care of that pest. So we have to use two different treatment programs uh, to treat for hard scale and soft scale. And the first trick with that is identifying which one you have. So like I said, send me that photo. I have no problems. I love getting them and identifying what's going on and which one you might be dealing with. So keep that in mind, hard and soft scales, two different treatment programs. You need to identify which one you have to get the correct program going for it. And then, 
We also have mites that create honeydew. And I talk about aphids, scale, and mites all together because a lot of times if you treat for aphids with the metacloprid and the honey doesn't stop and you're like, all right, maybe I got some scales, but wow, she said, look at the petioles and the twigs and I just don't see anything there. Uh, then I'm gonna say, take a piece of white paper, hold it under the branch, tap that branch, and see if you can see some mites that might fall onto that white paper. They also make honeydew. And they can also create that issue of that uh, kind of sticky, icky mess. So, and again, you can't kill mites with a metacloprid. So you're gonna have to go with a different uh, product in order to wipe out the mites. Uh, acetates work well, amomectin benzoate works well, um, but just kind of know your timing. So a lot of times I specifically talk about conifer mites and it's just because they tend to do a lot of damage before we tend to notice that they're there. Uh, we start seeing some of the, the canopy kind of turn yellowish, the interior needle start dropping. Um, you already see the stippling on the needles of where they've been feeding. So a lot of damage is usually occurred from conifer mites before we identify them. So I always recommend using the fast removing chemicals such as acephate to really knock them out of the tree quickly. It'll usually knock them out in 24 to 48 hours. That's the whole idea behind uh, the acephate products is they're very quick moving. And that way you stop that feeding right away. Um, then you can come in with a chemical with a longer residual uh, to maintain uh, that clearance on those, those trees. But Definitely always look for the mites, and if they just don't occur in conifers, they occur in hardwoods. We've seen quite a bit actually showing up in our oak trees now. Uh, so keep in mind, look for those little guys. They're tiny, they're hard to see, but on white paper, you can kind of figure out which one's which. And the other thing I want to say with mites is they like dirty plant material. So if you happen to have you know a bunch of trees on a dirt road and they're constantly getting dust blown up into them, there's a really good chance that's an excellent environment for mites. So go ahead, feel free, give those trees a wash. Kind of like going through the whole month of February without any rain. It doesn't hurt, give those trees a quick wash, knock them down, clean them off, uh, get them ready to absorb water and keep out the pests. So the other one I wanna talk about that we're starting to get photos on is thrips and whitefly. It's spring, spring is here, so these guys are starting to come out. Um, we've had some issues with people complaining about a metacloprid not working well as soil drenches. Um, against thrips and white flies, and it's mainly because they're a mobile pest, so you have to have a really high concentration in the tree in order to get good control over this pest. Um, so that's why we, we really recommend trunk injection when you're doing this one. Knowing you got the full dose on the tree, making sure you got the concentration levels you need, you can really take out these mobile pests much better. And so if you are dealing with myoporum thrips uh, or ficus, uh, those guys are hard to treat in general. Uh, so make sure you go with the long-term, more of a metacloprid, your long protection type chemical to really uh, keep those pests at bay. Um, the other thing I want to say is timing is usually more reactive, unfortunately, with these pests. People notice them and they treat immediately. So if that's going to be your case, uh, I tend to say uh, do two chemicals, do the acephate followed by the metacloprid, so you get that really fast knockdown, but that good complete coverage and, and, and long residual. Uh, that way you know they're not going to reinfest. I've had some people using insect growth regulators, such as azadiractin against whitefly. Um, it is very effective because, be, because it's an insect growth regulator, it does kind of repel that pest. It makes it not want to feed or reproduce on that plant material. Um, so it, it, it does clear them out of the area quickly by using that type of, of application as well. So keep that in mind. It, it, it's also an option. They're usually organic and they're usually OMRI. So if you're working in a situation where you need to maintain those type uh, products, then by all means, go ahead and use an azotractin against these. Okay, so into the red gum lerpsilid and tortoise beetle. And I know you guys will always say she always has to talk about the eucalyptus pest, and yes, I do. Um, and it's only because eucalyptus trees make up so much of our canopy here in California. People don't realize it, but they're all throughout the state. It's almost 20% of our urban canopy. Uh, so we, we do need to maintain and protect these trees. They've been here long enough that some people no longer call them invasive. Well, they're still invasive, but still. <laughs> uh, they've now become a part of our landscape and we, we need to maintain them. Otherwise they do become liabilities as we know. So that being said, uh, tortoise beetle and lerpsilids are actually very easy to treat with the metacloprid. Metacloprid will work against both of them. You can do it as a soil drench, trunk injection. Uh, the real trick is you want to get it into the tree uh, before the pests are really mobile and really feeding. You want to give it plenty of time to get out there and circulate into the new tissue. 
uh, and really get in there and protect the tree prior to the pests feeding. So the trick with eucalyptus trees is they do flower, right? So I'm talking about midacloprid, which has a bee box label, which means you have to make sure that you do not apply this when the tree is in flower. And eucalyptus trees have kind of an erratic flowering habit. So I really recommend doing your applications in the fall. When the trees aren't in flower, get ahead of it, make sure it's protected so that when the pests do come out in spring, uh, the chemicals are already there and, and protecting the tree. And that's a way to really stop these infestations from getting out of hand. Because unfortunately, when they do uh, get to the point, they will start actually causing dieback on the trees. And that's when we start seeing those dead branches uh, and the overall decline of the tree. And so if we can prevent that from happening, we'll keep the trees happy, healthy. They won't be aborting their leaves and dumping leaves and being messy. And maybe people will like eucalyptus trees a little bit more. I know, I know, I'm trying, I'm trying. One day I'm gonna sell this one. <laughs> Uh, but also metacloprid will work against uh, the eucalyptus longhorn borer and the uh, bronzing bug, which also attack them. So there's lots of good benefits uh, to treating our eucalyptus trees. Okay, and this is the one, if you're not on the coast, you're probably not dealing with this one too much. Uh, currently, we're coming to the season where we start seeing our oakworm and our tussock moth. And people tend to speak about them kind of interchangeably, which they are pretty different. Um, the oakworm would normally give us at least two life cycles in a year, whereas the tussock moth really only does one. Uh, the oakworm is more of just a nuisance that gets all over stuff, and it tends to be more out in the, in the coastal counties, whereas the tussock moth has no problem going more inland to hotter, drier areas. But this one is a real nuisance because uh, of those actual hairs on the moth. Um, they can really irritate people. Um, there, there's something about them that can get on your skin and, and cause you to have allergic reactions. And so when these get into parks and areas where the public is in, in trying to enjoy themselves, they can be a, a real issue uh, besides just falling out of the tree on you. <laughs> so the nice thing about it is chemical wise, it, it's the same chemical that works for them. So anything from blasting out of the trees with water, which yes, we see that happen on a regular basis, uh, to using acephate or dinotefuron. Um, those are fast acting chemicals. Uh, they work well against this pest when they're actually out and feeding. Um, if you choose to use something more along the lines of the amamectin benzoate, you wanna use this at least six weeks prior to the pest coming out and starting to feed because it takes a lot longer to circulate throughout the tree and really protect the tree from the pest. So kind of keep that in mind when dealing with this one. Um, the one I didn't address on this slide, which I probably should, because we're starting to talk more about it, is the oak, roll, uh, oak leaf roller. Um, that one's a little bit trickier to control, only for the fact that it feeds on the leaf and flower tissue uh, of, of our oak trees. And so our chemicals and most chemicals don't go into the flower. We don't want chemicals in our flowers. So when they're feeding on the flowers, we can't really control them. If you have an oak tree that is not in flower, by all means, go ahead and treat it. And as those uh, leaf rollers uh, feed on the leaves, they can get the chemical, you can take care of them that way. But just pay attention and make sure your tree is not in flower. So any questions on that one, I get a lot. So feel free, you can email me at the end. I have my contact information, uh, but yeah. Ask any clarifying questions you might need on this one. Western pine beetle, you guys are pretty used to. We've been dealing with this guy for years. And funny, my prediction is we're gonna be dealing with them for many more years to come. Uh, if this mega drought is in fact uh, something that we will be dealing with again, um, then I have a feeling these bark beetles are, are gonna become a pretty permanent nuisance we're dealing with. That being the case, just know the western pine beetle is the one that's more prevalent in California. Uh, this one uh, tended to fly later when it got warmer. So usually we start seeing it April. Um, I will tell you right now, I was up in Tahoe the second week of February and I saw new attack sites. So because of our warm early spring we got, those beetles were already out and flying uh, and, and attacking the trees. So unfortunately, uh, we know this is going to be a problem again this year just due to the lack of water. So try and stay ahead of it. Whenever we're trying to treat for these pests, we always want to treat the trees prior to the pest flying uh, and being out. So if you can, do your drunk injections in fall or early spring. If you actually have to do applications in the middle of their flight, 
it is really best to trunk inject the tree as well as spray the tree. And the reason is, is the spray will protect the tree while that chemical inside the tree is moving and protecting it. So that way you, you don't risk losing a tree while the treatment's still trying to get around and circulate and protect the tree. We're going to be doing a, a webinar hopefully sometime in March specifically on bark beetles uh, from a couple of the masters of the research on these pests, uh, Dr. Chris Fedek and Dr. Don Grossman. And so uh, by all means with this, this new issue we're going to be having with this particular pest, definitely jump on that webinar and you'll hear years and years of expertise on how to deal with these pests. Uh, the other one we tend to get more in our urban community is the Ips and Graver beetle. Uh, this one is a, it's much more populous, but it takes a little bit more for these pests to really kill a tree. So they give us a lot of time in order to save and protect our trees. Um, so if you happen to see a conifer with a dead branch here, you look at it, and it doesn't look like it broke from wind or anything like that, uh, definitely take a look. It might be the engraver. Sometimes they'll actually attack the branch itself and girdle the branch as the branch dies or sometimes they'll attack right below the branch and kill the branch that way and the branch dies. Um, either way, it's usually a small area of vascular tissue that they've disrupted. And so we're able to actually inject and protect and, and save that tree. So the chemical we're mainly using for this one is abamectin benzoate. Um, I've heard some people using abamectin, that will work as well. Some people have recommended using acephate. I'm not a big fan on the acephate, mainly for the fact that um, it does move through the tree quickly, but the residual is so short uh, it, it doesn't really come close to protecting the tree for the life uh, or the flight of this particular pest. Uh, so keep that in mind with that one. And then just a couple of the invasives that I, I want everyone looking for. Keep looking for these guys. How many of you guys have seen the gold spotted oak borer? Hopefully if you're in Northern California, you're not saying yes, because right now it's still only in Southern California, but it is one firewood truck away from making up to Northern California and out through other states. So be aware of this one. Uh, this one is a flathead bore, so inherently it makes that D-shaped exit hole where it's flat on one side, rounded on the other. So that being said, if you happen to see any sort of D-shaped exit holes on your oaks, um, mostly your coast live oak, sometimes the canyon, sometimes the black oak, those are the main ones we'll see it on. They can go into other oaks like Engelman, but they're not as common. Uh, so. Keep your eye out. If you see that D-shaped exit hole, odds are it might be that gold spotted oak borer. And inherent to its name, it's got six gold spots on its back. But I've been working with this pest since 2002 and I've never seen one in the wild. I've seen them on sticky traps, I've seen them in labs, but I've never seen it on a tree just sitting there in the wild. So they tend to be up in the canopy, which makes them hard to identify visually. So look for the holes, look for the uh, galleries underneath the bark. Uh, and that's usually how we identify what's going on with this one. But it almost always starts with like a thinning of the canopy, a yellowing of the canopy. So keep that in mind. And right now the recommendation uh, has been uh, sprays of carbaryl by the Forest Service. Uh, they've also done research that showed trunk injection of imidacloprid works well. Um, and they're still working on the research on the emmect and benzoate for uh, trunk injection on this particular pest. So once that research is out, I'm, I'm sure you'll see that publication notification. The invasive shot hole borer. This guy is still currently only in central and southern California. Uh, not yet known to have spread up to northern California and infested. There's been a couple of occurrences of it showing up in northern California, but it did not establish. Uh, so that is excellent news. And it's mainly because you guys on the front lines out there are looking for it. If you happen to see this little ambrosia beetle and it's done a mass attack on a tree, and there's always some sort of weeping or bleeding associated with it, that's going to be this little beetle who's vectoring the fusarium. This pest is unique in the fact that when it bores into the tree, it's not really eating the tree. It's actually boring in, bringing its own fungal infection of fusarium, planting it, growing it, and then eating off that fungus. Uh, it then lays its brood inside the tree, and the female actually backs out of the hole and protects its whole brood inside. So it's, it's a unique pest. It reproduces very quickly. It has the ability to reproduce every six weeks if it wants in good conditions. Um, and then the majority of the, the eggs tend to be female and then brothers and sisters mate in the galleries and they come back out and they're ready to infest. So this one does have the ability to move quickly and the fact that it vectors along this fusarium infection uh, can also uh, be difficult on our trees. So a lot of times when we're working with a particular pest, we're always treating for the pest as well as the disease that it's vectoring. 
Um, so any of our chemicals that work on our boring pests, uh, we've heard people using imidacloprid, amectin benzoate. Uh, for the fusarium, uh, the research out of UC Riverside was showing that uh, the tebuconazole, propoconazole, the zoles, uh, were working well against the, the fusarium infection itself. So keep in mind, if you have this pest, you want to treat for the pest as well as the disease. Uh, so you can eliminate its food source as well as the pest. So let me know if you have any questions on that one. I'm kind of running out of time because we got a tiny bit of a late start. So I have a few more slides I want to get through. Um, this is just a close up of the fusarium that that particular pest vectors. Uh, so you can see you get the staining of the bark. And in some varieties, such as olive, the fusarium itself can kill the tree, not just the pest. So once it introduces it, that's very virulent in those specific varieties and can kill the tree. So keep that in mind working with this one. Um, preventatively, use your fungicides if you can, especially if it's a high value tree. Okay, the western oak bark beetle vectoring the foamy bark canker disease. This one's a mouthful, but it looks very similar to the invasive shot hole borer. The only difference is the western oak bark beetle is a native beetle we always have here that tends to rear its ugly head during drought. Uh, but now it's picked up this disease it's carrying. Uh, it's, a, it's in the Geosmithia family. And so it causes that same weeping or oozing um, from the attack site as we tend to see with the invasive shock borer and fusarium. So that's why it's kind of easily mixed up. It's nice that the treatment happens to be the same. So if you do happen to misidentify, uh, you're going after your insecticide as well as your fungicide treatments uh, with these. So that being said, look for the mass attacks, look for the, the weeping and foaming. And then if you happen to cut off a branch, you're gonna see that vascular blackening where that disease has girdled uh, the tree. In this case, it's more the disease that kills the tree than the actual beetle itself. Our trees are pretty used to the dealing with these beetles during drought being natives. Um, but unfortunately, it's the disease that's really started to kill these trees. So if you do happen to see it, cut out the infected wood as quickly as possible. Treat and protect the surrounding trees. That's your best option. Um, we did see some great research where you could literally see where they had preventatively treated some trees with both the disease or for both the insecticide and the fungicide. And you could see how far it had moved through the tree. And then that's where the attack started. So you could see that the pest could actually identify how far the chemical had moved inside the tree, which is kind of frightening in a way. But um, yes, uh, it was effective in the fact that it, it did protect the remaining trees. Okay, so there's a couple invasive pests I want you guys just to keep your eyes out for. One is the South American palm weevil. This one is only in Southern California, and this particular weevil uh, likes to chew on the immature fronds in the meristem, and eventually if you get too bad of infestation, it'll actually eat out and kill the meristem of the palms. We're pretty much only seeing it in the Canary Island date palms at this point in time. It does have the potential to go to other palms, but so far we have not really documented that. Um, the reason why I'm saying watch for this one is because we could very easily ship it someplace. Because whenever we get a palm tree, right, we pretty much, we tie up the, the, the fronds, we ship it off, and we want to keep those palms, uh, fronds tied up until it's actually planted out and established. At which point we open it up and we could have this guy in here and he could have destroyed the entire thing while we were waiting for the, the plant to establish. So it's very, very important to inspect any palms you're going to be having shipped up or planted out. Look at them while they're on the ground. Look in there, make sure that meristem's healthy. Uh, they've found imidacloprid works well for treating this. So if you are gonna be receiving a palm, make sure they've treated it with imidacloprid before it's left the site. Um, and then if you have any issues or in, in the infected area where this pest is, you may wanna be doing preventative soil drench with imidacloprid. If you find you're actually already under attack, you may wanna to go to trunk injection to get that chemical up to that meristem that much quicker. So keep your eye out on this one. He has the ability to travel and travel quickly. And it's easy to identify where he's been. So that's the telltale sign of this particular pest, those notches in the fronds. So it's where they have been young fronds, they've been eaten, and as they expand out, you can see very clearly where the feeding has taken place. So keep in mind, this is an extreme case, and that canopy was soon, the bear stem was soon eaten out of that one. So always, always remember, when you're doing this to identify what's going on and treat as quickly as possible. The other one I want you to keep your eye out for is this spotted lanternfly. I know if you guys have heard about it, it's been on the east coast 
Um, they've been having quite an issue with it on the East Coast. It's managed to make it out here to California a couple times dead, but now all of a sudden it has made it out to California alive and has been identified in Davis, California. So we have not yet heard of it actually infesting, uh, but at this point in time, be aware of it, look for it. This one is one of those pests that sadly the natural predators don't even want to deal with. <laughs> Usually we'll see birds go after these, but unfortunately not in this case. Uh, so this particular pest um, is unique in the fact that it lays very large egg masses on the trees, easy to identify. Uh, the pest itself um, has got the, the spotted wings, but when they open up, there's this bright red color. It, it's pretty hard to mistake. And then that immature state, that's kind of that scary red frog look. Um, yeah, that, that one will give you nightmares. But yes, and their problem is, is these guys infest in mass. When they start to reproduce, the female can lay anywhere from 30 to 150 eggs. And so they can build their populations very quickly. And the reason why we're so concerned about it here on the West Coast is because we know it'll get into our grapevines. We also know it'll get into our orchards, such as apples, almonds. So if anyone happens to see this pest, please, please report it immediately. You can let me know, County Ag know, anyone, just speak up. Even if you've misidentified, we're fine with that. We'd rather have 100 misidentifications and then let this guy slip through uh, because he is definitely gonna be an issue for our agricultural industry here in California. So last thing I wanna talk on in the last couple minutes, I know we're over, but we got a late start and DPRS has an hour, so you guys have to listen to me for an hour. <laughs> So the last thing I want to talk about is fortifying tree health against pests and disease. And the best way to do that is by making sure they have enough water. That is the number one issue with trees in our environment, is they usually do not have enough water. Or if they do, it's because we're watering them and we're way over watering them and we're now drowning them. Uh, so there's a couple products I'm going to talk to you about. One is the humates and humectants that help hold water in the root zone. Um, there's some various products out there. One's called Moisture Manager, one's called Hydrotain, there's another one called Nutri-Root. Um, but they all use that same idea that helps hold that water in the root zone of the tree. So if you're taking time to actually water your tree, add this in. It adds about, you know, about a dollar for, you know, a small tree to really get it to establish. It is worth it. Uh, it's amazing how it helps the trees hold on to their leaves just because they can actually get the water into their roots and, and establish their root zones. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it because we are kind of running out of time here, but this was a great picture of where they used it on every other tree. So the tree on the left didn't get the hydrotain with the humates and humectants, the tree in the middle did, the tree on the left didn't. And you can see how those trees uh, were so different in the fact that they got watered initially and then 90 days later the tree that got the treatment was still able to hold on to its leaves because it was able to establish its root system. So if you have questions on this one, give me a call. I think we'll be using a lot more of these type products in the future, uh, especially with this mega drought situation we're dealing with with our trees. The other thing I want to talk about is chlorosis in trees, mainly micronutrients. Micro micronutrients are like the vitamins of trees. They're always telling us we got to stay healthy, we got to take our vitamins if we, you know, want to not get sick. It's the same idea with trees. So when we start talking about tree health though, I always say take a soil sample because that'll tell you what you're really deficient in your nutrients. And it's also gonna tell you if you have way too many salts. Uh, here in California, we have a lot of issue with high salts, whether it's from our soil itself, the water we're supplying it, or the fact that we might be using reclaimed water. So first step in order to get the right nutrients available for a tree is get rid of the salts. So there's different ways you can do it. You can do it with sulfuric acid, you can do it with gypsum, or you can do it with this, which is an NAX, what they call salt flush. And basically what it is, it's adding calcium to the soil at high concentrations. That calcium actually knocks the sodium off the salt soil colloid and allows that sodium to be flushed out of the soil. And then the plant material can actually use the, the calcium that was added in. So first step, get rid of the salts as best you can out of the soil. I always recommend doing that soil test before, soil test after and then get in there and start giving the trees the micronutrients they need. So this was a tree on the left, you can see it got it June uh, in 2018, just by giving it micronutrients. Nothing else, just giving it the micronutrients it needed. You can see how much healthier it was the year later. Uh, same with this one on the left. Only difference was it was given micronutrients. So micronutrients, people don't realize how much of a key they are for trees. 
They are the overall health and building blocks trees need to be healthy and to sustain themselves against disease and pests. So same with palms. <laughs> I know it sounds strange. And what I love about palms is they literally give us a roadmap to telling us what nutrient they're deficient in. Um, so if you can look at your palm, Take a quick look, snap a photo, send me the photo, and I can pretty much tell you what's going on with that palm and what nutrient it is lacking. The only one I can't really tell you without a soil test is the boron, because boron deficiency and boron toxicity are very, very similar. <laughs> uh, so you, you might need a soil test for that one. But uh, once you give them the, the micronutrients they need, uh, you'll have a nice, healthy, uh, and nice green palm, or any tree in that case. Micronutrients really are the key. And the one thing I always say about palms, which people don't realize, but if you ever see the top of a palm that's starting to bend, if it's kind of leaning over, that is almost always a nutrient issue. You give them the correct nutrients they need and they straighten right back up. So keep that in mind. If you have a bending palm and it's not because of the wind, odds are, and you're not in and out, the other, the other caveat, you're not in and out, then it's likely a nutrient issue. So that's everything I wanted to cover today. Uh, you guys have any questions, feel free to go ahead and type it into that chat box that you find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I can answer any questions you have, or please feel free, you can email me anytime, call me, uh, text me. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or give you any clarifying information you might need. All right, Zach, do we have anybody sending any 